Hi everybody, Professor Cruz here. Welcome to our week three lecture for religion, ethics, and ecology, where we are looking at the topic of intersectional justice and racial justice. So we uh, have our final week of topics, and we begin our week with celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Monday the 18th of January, 2021, being MLK Jr. Day, holiday celebration, about this individual who played a important role in civil rights struggle. And that's one of the reasons that I had us begin this week by reading his 1963 letter from Birmingham jail that he wrote while he was arrested as part of the Alabama civil rights movement in Birmingham that many of you may be familiar with from your high school history lessons. And in particular, we're thinking about what are the political and moral and ethical dimensions of Dr. King's work in this letter and other things that we read for this week, and uh, why are they important? So you'll remember a brief context. Dr. King is writing this letter um, in jail after he's been arrested in response to a letter from um, eight white church leaders in the South who were critical of Dr. King and the lunch counter and other protests that have been going on not just in Birmingham, um, but in the South in general in this period. And so his letter is laying out sort of a series of responses to the critiques that these church leaders had made and provide many useful insights for some of the questions that we've been wrestling with. So one of the, the first kind of key things I want to highlight from his letter is this idea that Dr. King rejects the sort of the idea of waiting or this argument that um, civil rights movement, civil rights leaders are sort of moving too fast and they need to wait. And to that argument, Dr. King says, there comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into an abyss of injustice. And he says this in the context of this sort of long discussion about why um, blacks, not just in the South, but in America in general, are tired of this constant refrain to hear from whites that they just need to wait and be patient and things will change. And in fact, he argues that this um, belief in what he calls the myth of time, particularly among um, white moderates, such as these church leaders, are actually, in some ways he argues, worse than the kind of open white supremacist people that were in the um, Ku Klux Klan or Citizens Council and other sort of white supremacist groups that were operating across the South at this time, uh, attacking uh, civil rights movement leaders and general participants. And he says this because what he's arguing is that it's much easier to know who is opposed to you because they're openly condemning what you're doing versus someone who says, well, I believe and support what you're doing, but, and then offers all these qualifications. You should wait. It's too soon. Your tactics are wrong. And he is responding to that kind of wait argument. Now, importantly, Dr. King also argues, and this is probably one of his most famous quotes that you see on bumper stickers and billboards and all over the place, which is, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And in making this comment, King is responding to this critique in this letter that he and others are essentially outside agitators who have come into the sort of Birmingham community and are now raising a ruckus. And his response is first to say that the Southern Christian Leadership Council actually has long-standing roots in all the southern states, and so he already has institutional ties to Birmingham and Alabama. But more importantly, that in the fight for racial justice, there is no outsider. As an American, everyone, regardless of where you live, has a vested interest in fighting for a more um, racially equal and just society. And so therefore, critiques that he and others in the civil rights movement are sort of outside agitators, he says really is uh, doesn't hold any water as an argument. Now, a third argument he makes that is particularly fascinating for our discussions um, in this class and thinking more broadly about ethics in society and politics and ethics. So Dr. King says there are two types of laws. There are just laws and there are unjust laws. Now he says a just law is a man-made code that squares with a moral law or what he calls the law of God, whereas an unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. So as he says, any law that uplifts humanity and human person, 
sorry, that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. And then King goes on shortly after in his letter to add that there are some instances when a law is just on its face, but unjust in its application. And this gets to some of the questions we've been uh, discussing in earlier weeks about sort of utilitarian ethics and this question of means versus ends. And King is arguing the means and the ends both need to sort of line up. And more importantly, he's raising this challenge about the sort of foundational basis of justice and what we consider just. And at least in his case, he's arguing that kind of this higher moral law, which in King's opinion and others um, derives from kind of the higher power of God in the Christian context here, and that in some ways our obligations to that higher moral law should trump our obligations to these man-made laws, particularly, as he notes, if they are meant to impose segregation to degrade the human condition to keep blacks um, oppressed and in, in those cases such as the lunch counter sit-ins and other examples uh, blacks and others are justified in breaking one law in the name of upholding a higher law now dr king also argues that oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever and that this urge for freedom will eventually come out and this gets to sort of social changes that were taking place at that time in the 60s um, through both kind of nonviolent protests and the kind of direct actions that the civil rights uh, sort of movement was most known for, as well as kind of the emergence of more confrontational um, black nationalist, black power movements we see with the Black Panthers, uh, Malcolm X and others, as well as sort of the emerging context of urban uprisings or urban riots, as they're often referred to at the time. And so he's sort of responding to this sort of broader arc of what's going on um, around in the United States in the early 60s when he's writing this letter. And I think we can certainly say that the questions he's reflecting on there are in as or more pressing today um, than they are than they were when he was writing this. If we think about, you know, this past year with the Black Lives Matter movement and the recent insurrection we saw by white supremacists and their friends and allies in D.C. on January 6th. These all speak to this kind of tension between nonviolent political action and more kind of militant confrontational action and how you mediate the two and the underlying causes that lead to um, one or another form of those kind of politics emerging. Now, this is where uh, Dr. King offers an interesting analysis that doesn't get talked about as much in kind of traditional glosses on, on Dr. King, which is that he asks us to rethink this label or this term extremist or extremism. Uh, which is, you know, often used as a way to kind of shut down political dialogue and discourse. And so he says, so the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. Will we be extremists for hate or will we be extremists for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or will we be extremists for the cause of justice? And so he's asking us to kind of rethink what is the sort of defining criteria for how we measure what an extreme action might be. Now, as I said, Dr. King is responding to kind of Southern church leaders initially um, in his letter. That's kind of impetus for why he's writing. And he also kind of calls out these church leaders, both for their, uh, you know, to be honest, their lack of spine, and also for their lack of what he considers kind of ethical or moral commitments to this broader struggle for justice. So as Dr. King writes, there was a time when the church was very powerful, but now the church is so often a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. It is so often the arch supporter of the status quo. And so here he's really trying to play out this tension, thinking about, for those of you that know a little bit about early church history, the kind of the idea that wherever early groups of Christians gathered, they were seen as disturbers of the peace, and they were run out of town by in some cases, Jewish authorities, but more often Roman authorities in the earlier period prior to, uh, you know, Constantine and the sort of legalization and adoption of Christianity by the Roman Empire. And so he says, you know, we've gone from this moment of Christianity being sort of a threatening uh, idea and power in society to kind of an upholder of the status quo and in the Southern context, an upholder of kind of white Southern um, sort of racial superiority and racial segregation. And one of the other things that this letter sort of 
really rubs Dr. King the wrong way is the sort of thanking of the police and law enforcement communities in Birmingham for their kind of good job of, uh, you know, maintaining law and order and preventing violence. But uh, King's response is basically that, sorry, I, I'm not on the same page with you about thanking the police for doing a great job here because we're on the receiving end of that great job um, of your police, Bull Connor and others. So as King notes, I don't believe you would have so warmly commended the police force if you had seen, and then he goes on to list a whole range of injustices and attacks against um, blacks, uh, young and old, in jail, outside on the streets, um, in, in daily life in Birmingham and elsewhere in the South, to say, I'm sorry, um, it's just as wrong, or even more, to use moral means to preserve immoral ends. So again, critiquing the kind of assumptions of these white church leaders about why and how civil disobedience and social movements should be acting kind of properly um, in their mind. So you can see here on the left, uh, this is a reproduction of some of the original pages that Dr. King wrote um, while he was in jail in April of 1963 and criticizing those church leaders and others um, in his notes and then on the right here, you can see just a, about a month later, in early May of 1963, so Dr. King and many of the other leaders had been arrested and were in jail at this point. And so many of the organizers that were still on the outside in Birmingham started to bring in more young people um, into the protests and into the marches and the political actions. And this is when Bull Connor, who was the police commissioner there in Birmingham at the time, um, brings out you know, fire hydrant, uh, attacks on people, dogs on people, and um, some of the iconic images like this um, from that summer of 1963 that then sparked the kind of public outcry that led that following year in 1964 to the passage of the Civil Rights Act and then in 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. So we're kind of seeing these important moments of history um, unfolding and thinking through you know, how Dr. King as one of the many leaders at this time was thinking about these challenges. So I thought it might be um, useful to give a little bit of context about, you know, the things we're thinking about today and some of the ongoing histories that have informed what's going on today. And in some people's minds show us that we haven't learned a lot from history, um, but also allows us to see where we have uh, kind of moved forward. Now, another one of the articles we looked at for this week, um, Wolana Karinga's article, Living the Legacy of Dr. King, and he argues that we can think about the history and legacy of Dr. King in this kind of bigger arc of black uh, history and black freedom struggles. And he, in fact, notes that within black history, there's a long list of prophets, messenger saints, and holy men and holy women who went forth to seek and speak truth, promote and do justice, and bring good into the world. And he very much locates Dr. King in that kind of longer um, historical tradition. One that importantly, Karinga argues, is shaped very much by religion, uh, religious beliefs, and religious devotion. And this is certainly true for Dr. King as a uh, pastor. So Karinga argues that um, Dr. King taught us to value the sacredness of human life, arguing against capital punishment, war, police brutality, and other forms of official violence. He taught us to love peace, cherish freedom, pursue justice, and sacrifice for them. Now Karinga also highlights in this piece Dr. King's claim that we have both a moral right and a responsibility to resist evil, which includes disobeying the established order and its unjust laws. Right? We saw Dr. King referring to this in the letter from Birmingham jail. And Karinga's, Karinga goes on, thus when a man-made law conflicts with moral law and reasoning, we have not only the right, but the responsibility to resist it. So this goes again to that tension between just and unjust laws. Not only how do we know them, but also, uh, sort of what is our moral duty in the face of injustice? Do we sort of hold the line that, you know, this is the law and I have to respect it? Or do we break that law in the service of some higher calling? And we've certainly seen these ethical tensions playing out between law breaking on one hand and law enforcement on the other on this past year with Black Lives Matter debates and with other protests where this question of um, is and this goes to the kind of the heart of civil disobedience that Dr. King was advocating. You know, is it morally just to break a law in order to uphold kind of this higher social good, this natural or moral law, um, as King called it? 
Now, Karenga also highlights Dr. King's claim that to ignore evil is to become an accomplice to it. So this gets back to, again, to um, King's critique of these white church leaders who were unwilling to really kind of put their skin in the game and when it came to supporting the civil rights struggle in the South. Now, Karenga also argues that religion must have a social role as well as a spiritual one. And this is something that was very important for Dr. King. The fusing um, of these two for him were always kind of part of how he thought about the world. Um, it was very hard, although you can certainly see it, um, but for Dr. King to separate out how his religion um, shaped his views and what was or wasn't a sort of a religious ethic versus a political um, or moral ethic. And then Karenga also reminds us of the centrality of struggle, not only um, to free ourselves, but also to what he describes as build and sustain the beloved community or good world. A beloved community of humanity based on mutual respect, nonviolence, peace, justice, and cooperation for common good. And this was certainly a key you know, idea behind much of Dr. King's work. And this became, in some ways, more pronounced in the last few years of his life as he moved from kind of uh, a more intentional focus on uh, race and the civil rights movement to this kind of broader focus on issues of um, social and economic justice that would lead to um, things like the Poor People's Campaign in 1967, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Now, in the article, The King We Need, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., Moral Philosopher, Charles Johnson delves in a little bit further to some of the moral philosophy and ideas of Dr. King that we've been looking at. And he argues that King was more than just a civil rights leader. In fact, the, the Dr. King was one of America's greatest moral and political philosophers. And he says his life was founded on deep, sophisticated, and courageous spiritual convictions. Now, Johnson argues that to really appreciate fully the legacy and the moral philosophy of Dr. King, we need to kind of get beyond the superficial story of Dr. King that, you know, gets celebrated one day a year and really get into what he described as the complex yet ethically coherent philosophy, which he argues was part social gospel, part personalism, or this idea that um, belief that God is infinite and personal, and part Gandhi and Satyagraha. Now, Satyagraha is sort of the uh, Hindu term for these nonviolent political struggles that Gandhi made famous in resistance against the British um, under British occupation in India. So this idea of merging the social gospel of kind of doing good and helping others, this idea of God both as a personal sort of deity, but also an infinite deity, and putting these sort of ideas, particularly the social gospel, into action through these nonviolent direct actions, lunch counter sit-ins, um, boycotts, and other things. Now, Johnson also calls special attention to one of Dr. King's uh, most important but lesser-known sermons from February 4th, 1968, which was the drum major instinct. And this is um, one of, if not the last sermon that Dr. King gave before he was assassinated. And, and in that, Dr. King argued that we have to resist the tendency to want to be out front in the spotlight, to be, you know, always seen and heard kind of in the limelight, have our, you know, 60 seconds of fame as the drum major would be um, out in the field. And instead, King argues, well, that kind of uh, what we call that tendency or that desire to want to be seen is OK. But what we should strive for first is to be first in love. So he says, I want you to be first in moral excellence. I want you to be first in generosity. That's what I want you to do. And as Johnson goes on to argue, part of what he believes is the wide appeal of Dr. King was precisely that King's ethical values were reflected in how he lived his life. So he walked the talk, um, as we might say. But Johnson argues, if moral authority is based on moral consistency, then the above statement, which King felt encapsulated his life's primary work and vision, which is this kind of drum major instinct, demonstrates why the liberal theologian became a leader admired by all Americans and world citizens of goodwill, for he lived his own advice. I want to say that I was a drum major. Say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all of the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. 
I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind, but I just want to leave a committed life behind. And that's all I want to say. We often think of Martin Luther King Jr. as a great civil rights leader and activist, and he was. But first and foremost, until his death, he was a preacher of the gospel. He was a minister. And he uses this message to reframe how we think about the good life, how we think about success. And Jesus uh, becomes an example in the text. Someone who did not have a lot of prominence, was born impoverished, uh, did not have uh, many uh, accolades in terms of temple authorities or Roman officials. Uh, but Jesus taught that the greatest among us is those who are those who are able to serve all of us. And so King uses that to say everybody has the capacity to be great because we all have the capacity to serve. All one needs is a heart full of grace and a soul that's generated by love. And we too can be great. So Charles Johnson also argues in looking at these speeches from Dr. King and his sort of the broader arc of his life that we can discern three kind of distinct phases of Dr. King's um, political activity and um, role in the civil rights movement. And he describes the first stage as nonviolence as the way. So in this initial phase of King's public life, Johnson argues that his core beliefs could be kind of summed up in three quote, transcendentally profound theses, um, which Johnson describes as follows. And the first is the idea of nonviolence, both in word and deed, and that it's not just a protest strategy, but it's what King called a way, a daily praxis, where people must strive to translate into each and every one of their deeds. So this is very much um, the idea of living the walk that many people believe Dr. King was a really good example of um, putting into practice. Um, the second of these theses that Johnson talks about is that King encouraged everyone to practice agape or this sort of radical love or the ability to unconditionally love something, not for what it currently is, but instead for what it could become. It's kind of uh, telos, if you will, going back to some earlier conversations. And so, you know, this very much gets to the heart of Dr. King's willingness to try to, you know, find common ground, even with the most kind of extreme um, white Southern segregationist in order to try to find sort of a path forward um, for civil rights. And then finally, he argues the third, kind of third important thesis that underlined King's public life was that King understood the ways in which we're all interconnected and interdependent. And it really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. Now, Johnson described this idea of King's, this kind of we relation, as he calls it, um, as really being at the heart of King's moral philosophy because it involved a recognition that, quote, moves us to feel a profound indebtedness to our fellow men and women, predecessors and ancestors, end quote. And this was really the period when Dr. King was rising through the ranks of the civil rights movement in the 50s and early 60s and becoming one of its central leaders, um, which by the time he reaches the age of uh, 34 in 1964, um, he is given the Nobel Peace, Nobel Peace Prize um, for his work. Now, Johnson argues that stage two of King's life, or what he calls what can I do, uh, was a bit of a midlife crisis for King, even though he hadn't you know, really reached his midlife. So in the aftermath of the civil rights struggles of the early and mid-1960s, uh, such as the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 64 and the Voting Rights Act in 65 that I mentioned earlier, King is now kind of struggling to figure out um, sort of where do we go from here and uh, you know where can he best put his energies some people are telling him well you can just retire back to Atlanta and you know just take up as a you know the pastor at your church and focus on that or other people say well you, maybe you can become a president one of the black colleges um, in the south but Kings doesn't really want to do any of those things he still has the passion to keep fighting he feels like he's not done with the work yet and so he begins to turn his focus to these broader issues of social and economic injustice in America. And this is where we move into what Johnson describes as kind of the third stage of King's public life, his last and greatest dream. So as Dr. King wrote really early in his career in the 50s, it's, it's a well-known fact that no social institution can survive when it has outlived its usefulness. This capitalism has done. It has failed to meet the needs of the masses. And this is 
sort of part of a, a much more extended critique of kind of unrestrained um, excesses of capitalism that King talked about throughout his work, but really began to focus on more intentionally in the late 60s. Now, this final phase of King's life included uh, two important themes that brought out this critique. Uh, one was his opposition to the Vietnam War, and the other was kind of his attack on capitalism in relation to the widespread poverty that it was creating in America, and particularly for blacks, not just in the South, but certainly in the South where sort of the heart of much of the early civil rights campaigning was taking place. And it was this work that led him to be involved in the Memphis um, trash strikes and also the Poor People's Campaign that SCLC launched in 1967. Now, as Johnson notes, um, had he lived and realized his Washington project of leading the poor of all races and ethnic backgrounds to shut down the nation's capital, King might have become the most dangerous man in America. The one public figure much revered who could potentially unify in his person and through the power of his moral authority, the civil rights, labor, and anti-war movements. And in fact, the very uh, fact that King was moving in this direction um, has led some scholars to argue that this is one of the reasons that he was assassinated, was that he was becoming um, too much of a threat to too many different centers of power. It was one thing to be challenging um, segregation and racism in the South, but now his campaign is extending to calls for an economic bill of rights, for a universal um, kind of wage, for a redistribution of wealth. He's criticizing and critiquing U.S. involvement in Vietnam. And all of these things are making more and more enemies um, for King on sort of those in positions of power. Now, another one of the documents we read from Dr. King for this week was his 1967 speech to the American Psychological Association, APA, where unlike some of the other documents that people are familiar with, King is really speaking more to an academic gathering here and social scientists and kind of thinking about the role of social scientists and researchers in both understanding and exposing racism and institutional racism um, in America. So King says, white America needs to understand that it is poisoned to its soul by racism. And the understanding needs to be carefully documented and consequently more difficult to reject. The present crisis arises because all that is historically imperative that our society take the next step to equality, we find ourselves psychologically and socially imprisoned. The white majority, unprepared and unwilling to accept radical structural change, is resisting and producing chaos while complaining that there, if there were no chaos, orderly change would come. And so this is, again, going back to 63 and his critique of the white clergymen who are saying, wait, 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 uh, law and order, you're disrupting things. And so he's saying, again, you know, he's speaking to the same critiques here in 67 as he was in 63. And I would argue that those kind of comments from King, you know, delivered many decades ago are still as applicable today in 2021 as they were in 1967. Now, equally important, particularly given the time period we're in here, King also locates this phenomenon of emerging quote-unquote urban riots um, that have been dominating the news in 67 and will continue to um, through the rest of the decade. Um, he locates these within kind of a broader landscape of social injustice, uh, which he says are is produced by whites and maintained by these systems of institutional racism and um, injustice. So as King says here further on in that statement, the policymakers of the white society have caused the darkness. They have created discrimination. They structured slums and they perpetuate unemployment, ignorance, and poverty. It is uncontestable, sorry, it is incontestable and deplorable that Negroes have committed crimes, but they are derivative crimes. They are born of the greater crimes of the white society. Let us say boldly that if the violation of laws by the white man and the slums over the years were calculated and compared with the law breaking of a few days of riots, the hardened criminal would be the white man. These are often difficult things to say, but I have come to see more and more it is necessary to utter the truth in order to deal with the great problems that we face in our society. And in fact, King was very adamant that if we cannot have these honest conversations about race in America, we will never be able to face our problems and we will not see fundamental structural changes at least of the kind that he felt we needed.
Now, as I mentioned, um, King also highlights his opposition to the Vietnam War and economic inequality, and these are reflected again in the 67 speech to the APA. So responding to the critics um, who told him, you know, you should avoid this kind of contentious politics like, you know, you're, you're interested in racial equality. Why are you talking about Vietnam and, uh, you know, communism and capitalism? Those are things, you know, you should stay out of those, Dr. King, basically. And his response to that was, um, our, conscious, our conscience must ask the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a stand that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular. But one must take it because it is right. And that is where I find myself today. And in a sense, what he's saying to his critics is, look, I can't just kind of draw this artificial boundary around, let's say, the Vietnam War or economic inequality and pretend like it doesn't connect to racism or to militarism or to imperialism. Because in King's mind and many others of this time, the links were extremely clear and becoming more and more clear um, every day. And so for him, what he hears his critics saying is, you know, we want you to kind of partition your morality out into different areas and only apply it to certain categories and not to others. So Vietnam War is out of moral consideration. Racial inequality, okay, maybe that's something you can reflect on morally. And King was saying, you know, my view, these kind of intersections that Johnson talked about before that underlies philosophy did not allow King to separate these issues out in that way. Now, there's kind of three final points I want to highlight from King's speech to the APA. Um, the first is that Dr. King stressed the importance of civil disobedience in moral struggles for justice because he saw this as the middle path between sort of passivity and inaction on one hand and violence and um, sort of the breakdown of society on the other. So King said, I believe we will have to find the middle, sorry, the militant middle path between riots on the one hand and weak and timid supplication for justice on the other hand. And you can hear echoes of his critiques of the white church there from 63. That middle ground, I believe, is civil disobedience. It can be aggressive but nonviolent. It can dislocate but not destroy. And in fact, for King, if you remember from our readings, for him, there is, there's a, a very powerful productive tension in these acts of civil disobedience because without tension, King argues, you know, we're not going to see anything change. And so we actually need that productive tension in order for society to be able to advance and progress forward. Now, secondly, Dr. King stresses the importance of understanding the role of voting in black politics and social change and argues that one thing that social scientists can help bring to the table is to help us gain a clear picture of the moral power of electoral politics. So at this time, there was a debate going on about Okay, so there's a lot of energy and time being spent by civil rights organizers and leaders to get um, blacks registered, to get people of color registered, to get people um, out and trying to vote and use kind of those um, civic electoral politics. And some people thought, well, these aren't going to change these more fundamental structures of power. Um, and other people thought that they were. And so you kind of have this debate about does voting matter, essentially. And we can now see with kind of the benefit of hindsight that you know, those electoral gains for blacks and other people of color in the 60s did actually matter a lot. And there was a huge amount of white resistance to that happening in the first place. But we can also see that in the context of, you know, fights today of trying to disenfranchise people of color from voting and the gerrymandering and kind of rigging of electoral districts around racial and economic lines. So those, those issues still very much matter today. And we saw that, for example, those play out in the 2020 elections where race was an important factor for a whole number of different reasons um, and all different races in deciding how and why people were voting and also telling us a bit about who um, had an easier opportunity voting and who found it much more difficult to vote and why. So that's still very much a salient issue today. And that was one of the things King thought that social scientists could help bring to the table as a better insight and understanding into those questions. And then third, King was really laying the groundwork for his later moral philosophy to be able to deeply engage in his thinking and others' thinking with this idea of systemic racism in America. Because although the, our, the idea had been articulated in some ways, we didn't really have the sense of systemic racism or institutional racism 
Uh, we didn't have the language to talk about it quite the same way as we do today um, as they did in the early 60s, although they certainly understood all of the same um, critiques, they just maybe didn't use that specific language. So for example, as King argues in his speech, 10 years of struggle have sensitized and opened the Negro's eyes to reaching. For the first time in their history, Negroes have been aware of the deeper causes for the crudity and cruelty that govern white society's responses to their needs. They discovered that their plight was not a consequence of superficial prejudice, but was systemic. And so here we really start to see the emergence of this language um, and understanding of systemic and institutional racism. And then finally, from this speech, one thing I want to highlight is that Dr. King is speaking to an audience of psychologists, and so he ends on a reflection on the psychological term maladjusted and argues that maybe we want to rethink that term. Um, maybe we need a, an idea of creative maladjustment, he says. And the reason he says this is partly because he's uh, worried about what it is that we're adjusting to and that maybe that term um, sort of has a negative sense attached to it to describe people who aren't kind of willing to adjust to society. Um, but he wants to push back on that idea and say, well, maybe there are some things about society that we shouldn't be adjusted to because they're wrong. So King says here, I'm sure that we will recognize there are some things in our society, some things in our world, to which we should never be adjusted. There are some things concerning which we must always be maladjusted if we are to be people of goodwill. We must never adjust ourselves to racial discrimination and racial segregation. We must never adjust ourselves to religious bigotry. We must never adjust ourselves to economic conditions that take necessities from the many to give luxuries to the few. And so for King, the question is not so much, um, should we talk about the language of maladjustment, but rather, what, uh, what is it that we're trying to get people to adjust to? And are there some things that we don't want to accept and just kind of make normal, that we say normalized? So in thinking about these reflections, both from Dr. King himself and from other scholars writing about him, there are, I think, a few important lessons that we can take away thinking about how the intersections of religion and ethics and racial justice were playing out then in the 1960s and continuing today, kind of in our current period. And I think first and foremost is that the issues that Dr. King was addressing during the height of the civil rights movement in the 60s are still very much alive today in 2021. And you need look no further than just, uh, you know, last week or uh, recent weeks with the January 6th um, insurrection led by white supremacists, people carrying Confederate flags, um, T-shirts making references to Auschwitz, um, and kind of this white ethno-nationalist politics that was on clear display for the whole world to see in Washington, D.C. So it's very clear that the issues Dr. King was talking about in the 60s are still very much with us today, even if they've taken on slightly different forms, the underlying dynamics are still there. I think the second important point we can take away from thinking about these issues and rereading Dr. King today is that his life and his message was one in which ethics and the thinking about and reflecting on doing what was morally right in the fight for racial justice and the fight against racism was really at the core of his belief and he felt should be at the core of all of our ethical beliefs. So for King, these moral obligations were central to who he was and his identity. And for him and for many others during the civil rights period and for many people still today, those moral convictions were very deeply grounded or are very deeply grounded in uh, faith and religious traditions. And then I think the third uh, sort of takeaway from thinking about these questions in the past and today, both in our readings about Dr. King and other readings about Black Lives Matter movement, and some of the articles about sort of indigenous rights and the intersections of some of these different social justice issues is that these political issues continue to raise interlocking or intersectional questions about justice and ethics. And these ethical dilemmas and questions are one that we as a nation need to address together. But unfortunately, the burden of that work of sort of racial reconciliation is one that will fall on the shoulders of those of you that are young people today. Um, the generation in power today is still very much resistant to political change. 
starting to change a little bit, but still um, the institutional establishments are still very much the status quo and reflecting the same challenges that Dr. King faced in his day. So the lessons we take from Dr. King is that the struggle continues and it's one that we can't ever kind of rest on our laurels on because every generation has to continue to push um, the gains of the past forward as well as defending those gains that have been made by previous generations. So I think those are just a few of the important intersections between religion, ethics, and issues of racial justice that we can reflect on today when we think about the legacy of Dr. King and what he taught us. And also, I think it's important to remember that Dr. King's legacy was not just about Dr. King, but it was very much about a moment in time in the 60s. And we are very much living in a similar moment today of great social upheaval and social change, where once again, we're being asked to bring a new accounting of ethics and politics to the table. Okay, that wraps up our discussion on religion, ethics, and racial justice for this week.